When most people think of Snapmaker, they likely picture a 3-in-1 multifunction machine. This makes sense considering it's how they started in 2019 on Kickstarter with the launch of the original Snapmaker, which had swappable tool heads and has had quite a few revisions since. So I was surprised to see them release a standalone independent dual extrusion 3D printer called the J1 late last year with some pretty impressive specs. Snapmaker ended up reaching out asking if I was interested in testing out the J1 and providing my feedback, which I agreed to, and we unboxed this and set this up on live stream over on the Modbot Army channel a little over a month ago. Since then, I've been testing out its capabilities in both single extrusion and dual extrusion modes. So in today's video, we will be diving into the Snapmaker J1. We'll go over the printer specs, what the setup process was like, how it has performed, and I will give you my final thoughts based off of my experience with this printer so far. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Starting with the specs, the Snapmaker J1 is made up of a die-cast upper and lower frame, along with aluminum extrusion corners giving it its rigidity and a weight of 25 kilograms or roughly 55 pounds. The top of the machine has a thin aluminum removable cover, both sides have acrylic panels and the front has acrylic doors, so the J1 is a fully enclosed printer. The motion system is Cartesian, with both the X and Y axis riding back and forth on linear rails, and the Z-axis using a single motor lead screw combo with thick 12mm smooth rods. The bed is cantilevered, but the combination of those 12mm smooth rods and the beefy bed frame that connects the two makes it the most rigid that I've seen. As mentioned, the J1 is an IDEX 3D printer, meaning it features two independent extruders and hot ends. Both hot ends are direct drive with all metal hot ends, capable of reaching 300 Celsius out of the box. They both have filament runout sensors and one fan for the hot end heat sinks, along with a secondary layer cooling fan. In single or dual extrusion printing mode, you get 300 by 200 by 200 millimeter build volume, which drops down to 160 millimeters in X for copy mode and 150 millimeters in X for mirror mode. The bed doesn't have automatic bed leveling, but it does have a pretty unique assisted bed leveling that we'll cover a little bit more shortly. As for the bed material, it's called a PEI glass plate, which is definitely a first for me. It's a 5mm pane of glass that is smooth on one side and appears to be powder coated PEI on the other. It behaves the same as any other powder coated PEI I've used in that when the bed is warm, things stick down really nicely and as soon as the bed has cooled down, the parts pop right off. I still prefer a magnetic flex plate system, but as far as glass goes or a glass hybrid, it's definitely the best that I've used. It's a 24 volt system with a fairly large custom PCB bed heater that is insulated on the bottom. For interacting with the printer, there's a five inch Android touchscreen that is one of the better that I've used. You can use this to start prints from a full size flash drive or from the built in storage. Optionally, you can also print over USB or with the built in Wi Fi using their slicer software. There's also a strip of LEDs inside that can be turned on, off, or dimmed using that touchscreen. As far as I can tell, the firmware that's running on this printer seems like it was completely developed in house. There's one large ribbon cable and one additional bundle cable for each tool head, which does look very neat, but I wonder how it's going to hold up over time. The bed wires are ran through a thick sleeving beneath the bed, and although there is strain relief, I really wish there was a bit more slack. I'm not convinced it's actually going to be causing any issues because it has that strain relief, but it does seem like it's a little unnecessarily short. The entire unboxing to set up and first print was done on live stream over on the Modbot Army channel, which I will have linked in the description down below. It came packaged nicely and was encased in thick foam with cable ties on all of the motion components. It comes mostly assembled and all that you really need to do is attach the two spool holders on the back along with both of the acrylic side panels and the front doors. From the time we got this printer out of the box and actually started putting things together, it was roughly 20 minutes before we were able to power it on. Over the years, I've used multiple IDEX 3D printers stemming anywhere from roughly $500 up to $5,000. And one of the biggest pain points for all of them is the calibration process, specifically dealing with things like offsets. Because of that, I was really curious to see how that was addressed with this printer. The initial wizard takes you through everything from leveling the bed, calibrating XYZ offsets, confirming offsets, and getting vibration compensation or input shaping set up. It is easily the most guided and simple process I've ever seen on an IDEX printer. That custom PCB bed heater plays a very large role in this process. For leveling the bed, there are three leveling knobs and three large contact points above them on the PCB. To level the printer, the tool head moves above a contact point and probes it with the nozzle, making an electrical contact and giving the printer a read of its height. 
It will continue bouncing up and down over the contact, updating the reading while you adjust the knob. While this is happening, the screen tells you which way you need to rotate the knob and has a bar to show you when you have reached the correct height. Once it's at the correct height, it turns green and moves on to the next point, which it repeats for all three. This has proven to work really well, and in my printing, I've only had to ever so slightly adjust the back knob. Other than that, it's just been set from that initial calibration. Next is calibrating the Z offset between the two tool heads. The left tool head is stationary, while the right tool head has a knob that you can turn to raise or lower it. For this part, it once again uses the nozzle and bed pad to get the height for the left tool head. Then it moves the right tool head over the pad and bounces it up and down while you adjust it using the knob. Just like with the bed leveling, it tells you which way to turn it and tells you when it's at the correct height. At that point, you tighten two set screws which secure the hot end in place. XY calibration, which typically requires printing out some sort of calibration test and measuring or using the camera method that we covered just maybe a month or two back now, is fully automated. There's a square hole in the center of the bed PCB with contact points on each side of it. The nozzles drop into this square, touch the contact points to get measurements, and the machine calibrates those offsets for you. Once complete, the J1 has you load two spools of PLA so that it can run a quick test print just to verify that its calculations are correct. This is where I discovered my first real peeve with this printer. Both spools of filament mount on the back of the machine, which sort of rules out being able to put this 3D printer on a shelf. On top of that, it's difficult to feed the filament through the reverse Bowden into the tool head without removing the top lid of the printer. Originally, I thought it was just me that was maybe doing something wrong, so I reached out to Snapmaker and they let me know that nope, when you're loading filament, they recommend taking off the, the lid so that way you can feed the filament directly into the tool head. With rigid filament cut at a sharp angle, in some cases I was able to push the filament all the way through and down into the tool head, but in most cases now I am just lifting off the top when I need to feed in a new spool of filament. After the filament's loaded in, it's not an issue, but it's definitely a bit annoying and in my opinion, a very interesting design choice. If they had made the lid just an inch or two taller, then this reverse Bowden tube wouldn't have to be at such a vertical angle, which would make loading the filament into the tool head much easier. Also, most standard spools will actually fit inside of this printer. The community created some mods that do allow you to feed the filament from inside versus the back, which I may look into. It would have been really cool to see that as an option from the factory. When we did get the filament loaded, it ran a quick test to verify the Z offset. If you do have any issues with the print, you'll need to rerun the calibration, but ours turned out fine. Next, it runs an input shaping test. This is similar to the manual print method in Clipper or in the newer Marlin firmware. It prints out a file with different accelerations and speed values while it applies a range of corrections. Then it has you input which applied correction looks best that it then saves to the machine. This does allow the J1 to print quite a bit faster with minimal quality loss caused by things like ghosting. The last thing we did on stream was get the pre-sliced speed bend sheet printed up and test out the machine's backup mode. With backup mode, if one spool runs out of filament, it can swap over to the spool in the second tool head and finish the print. This is a very cool feature, especially if you're running a large print and just aren't sure if you've got enough filament, you can just have a second one on standby in case it does run out, it'll just continue that print instead of pausing the machine. The only thing we noticed was a slight quality difference in the overhangs when it swapped from the left tool head to the right tool head. Because the layer cooling fan is on the left for the left tool head and the right for the right tool head, each one favors that side of the printed part for cooling. As for slicing your own files, Snapmaker has their own Lubin software suite, which is open source and based on CNCJS along with Cura Engine. I played around with it for a bit, and for someone new to 3D printing, or if you are already familiar, it's likely plenty, but I felt a bit limited in options, and after a couple of prints, I did some additional digging. This is where I found a great community-created Prusa Slicer profile, and that's what I've been using ever since. There are some instructions in the Snapmaker forums, but this profile gives you the machine parameters, a 3D bed model, and two post-processing scripts. The first one allows for thumbnails on all prints to show up on the J1 screen, and the second one auto-uploads sliced files directly to the printer. You basically slice up a file and save it anywhere locally on your printer, and as it's saving, it's grabbed by the machine and also transferred directly to the J1. This has worked really well for me, and being able to use the latest Prusa Slicer and all of its features with the J1 has been a real treat. In my time with the J1, I've tested single extrusion, dual extrusion, alternative support materials, and duplication mode with this printer. Single and duplication mode are just set through the slicer, but the way duplication and mirror mode work is pretty clever. Typically, standard printing, duplicate printing, and mirror printing 
all require their own slicer profiles and are treated as independent machines by the slicer. This is because each mode requires slightly different G-code settings, which are typically set in the starting G-code. However, with the J1, it does it on a firmware level. This means you can slice a file as a single extrusion print, and as long as it's half the size of the full bed, when you go to print it, you can select duplication mode or mirror mode from the printer. This greatly simplifies the process and helps to keep things much more organized. I've been quite happy with the print quality I've gotten so far off of the J1. The dual extrusions have all turned out great, and really the only issue I've had is some stringing, which is mostly me just needing to dial in the settings a bit more. I probably need to drop down the temperature and also just play around with the retractions. Speed-wise, you can definitely push this printer, as I got to see with the Speed Benchy and one of the other initial prints, but for the most part, I've been going relatively middle of the range when it comes to speeds. I've been doing 120 to 150 millimeters per second on infill and around 100 millimeters per second, give or take on the parameters. And I believe initially I had it at 10K acceleration, but I've since dropped it down to 5K because I was really going more for just consistency than sheer speed. But if your goal is speed, I have no doubt that with enough tuning, you can definitely push those speeds quite a bit higher than that. Really the biggest limitation I think that you're going to be running into isn't really related to extrusion or the rigidity of the machine or motion system, but it's actually the cooling since both tool heads just have their single cooling fan and the shrouds are only hitting the part from one side. It's still a lot faster than many of the other 3D printers out there and a combination of the rigid frame with the linear rails and the resonance compensation allows it to print quicker but still maintain high quality. As always, there is no such thing as a perfect 3D printer and we've already touched on the filament holders being on the back of the printer and the annoyance of having to take off the lid every time you want to load a new spool of filament. One other thing we noticed when we were first assembling this printer is that both of the panels you install on the side as well as the lid on the top basically makes a complete seal. However, on the front door, you've got a pretty obvious gap around all the different sides of the door and I measured it, it's roughly three and a half millimeters on all sides. This to me was kind of a silly design decision because the printer is enclosed and if you're wanting to print with something like ABS, those gaps are really going to allow a lot of the heat to escape. I don't understand why they couldn't have made the doors two millimeters bigger in each direction or if they didn't want to do that, at least include some kind of a weather stripping around the seal to just again help keep the heat in. The nozzles on the J1 are brass and Snapmaker does sell various sizes of replacement hot ends, including a hardened steel upgrade, but they only come as a full set of hot ends. At a price of $50 or $60 for the entire hot end with fan, I don't see that as being a bad deal, but I still think it's unnecessary, and for those that are comfortable with swapping out a nozzle, they should offer that at least as an option. On the plus side from that, I have seen in their Facebook group that the nozzles are just MK8, and many of the users have successfully swapped them out to CHT for higher flow and abrasive printing. The last thing I'd like to see is spare parts being added to their web store. Currently, they've got the hot end uh, assembly and they've got the glass PEI bed, but for things like the various ribbon cables or the tool head board, they don't have that stuff. And yes, maybe most won't need it, but because they're not standard, uh, I personally would like to have at least one or two spares on hand. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. I think most people that purchase this would much rather get some of those more likely to wear sooner than later parts just to have on hand. So when it does happen, you can get your printer up and running quickly. The Snapmaker J1 definitely has its quirks, but it has largely impressed me. Without a doubt, this is the simplest to use and really the best user experience I've ever seen on an IDEX 3D printer. The way they've got their UI set up with the nozzle doing a lot of the probing for you and making it either automatic with the XY or semi-automatic with the bed leveling in the Z is is awesome and it makes it where even somebody that's not real familiar with 3D printing or knowing exactly what they're looking for can get this set up and running very quickly. I've loved the idea of IDEX 3D printers for a long time. The fact that you can use two different tool heads with two different materials, two different nozzles. You don't have to purge through a singular nozzle, but again, the experience I've had with calibration has just been so rough that it's been much more of a tinkering device. And I feel like this is definitely a big step in the right direction. If you need to print with multiple materials or have just been looking at IDEX 3D printers, at $1,300, the Snapmaker J1 is very competitive. 
I hope that you enjoyed this video and that I was able to answer the majority of your questions about this printer. If there are any other questions you have that I did not answer, please let me know in the comments down below. This definitely will not be the last time that we see this printer. I've already got a couple other ideas in my head for some testing that this IDEX setup is perfect for. So again, stay tuned because we will be doing more cool stuff with the ability to mix different materials. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I'll have links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.